Maybe start with just a little bit of a primer on the Black Lives Matter movement. People have a variety of understandings about, about what is going on in that movement, uh, some misunderstandings for sure. Maybe just talk a little bit about, about how it got started, how you got involved in it. Yeah, so let me just say I'm not the movement. The movement is bigger than me. The movement is bigger than you. The movement is us, right? It'll take all of us to win, and I just want to have that out there at the beginning. I think about St. Louis, uh, you know, Mike got killed on August 9th, um, and people came out just because his body was in the street. And at the beginning, you know, people would say that nobody was a protester then. People were just concerned, right? Um, and then the police fought the people, and the people said, I'm gonna fight back. And like, therein the movement began. Um, so one o'clock in the morning, I'm waiting for my best friend to wake up. He lives in Chicago, and I'm like anxiously waiting for eight o'clock to come so I can call him, because I'm like, Donnie, I think I'm gonna go to St. Louis. It looks wild. I wanna go and see for myself what's happening. So I get in the car, drive nine hours. I end up in St. Louis. I don't know anybody. I put on Facebook, I'm going to St. Louis, hope somebody knows somebody. Seven hours in, I get a call saying, we found somewhere for you to sleep. We know somebody who knows somebody. Um, and I ended up on West Forest, and I think about Twitter, um, as a platform I used to tell the story because I had no friends, right? Like, there, I didn't know anybody else down there, so it's like, I'm just going to tell whoever I can, and Twitter became the whoever I can. And one of the powerful things about Twitter is that I don't need, I don't need my friends to be awake, right? Somebody's always sort of around on Twitter. So I had about 800 followers in August, and I have about 200,000 now, um, and I was just trying to tell this story. And that was like the beginning of my time. I think about uh, my second day there was the, probably the first day of the curfew. And we, uh, the curfew was at midnight. We got tear gas starting at eight o'clock. And in that moment, I became a protester. I was like, this is just not the America. I know this is not how it should be. And I too am choosing to stand and resist. Um, so in terms of an initiative, no, I think it is a movement. I think that people are plugging into the spaces differently depending on what they want. I think that we, I think about the work that Ned and I do and the other people we are closest with are focused on this issue of police violence and how do we structurally and institutionally eliminate it and also change hearts and minds around this issue of safety. I think that there are many other people who are also focused on the other manifestations of state violence, whether it is mass incarceration, um, or a host of other issues. Let's talk about leadership within, that, within the movement. Uh, how has it formed? What does it look like? How, how do you know it when you see it? Yeah, I think that one of the beautiful things is that, you know, we just struggled through this in the class, but this uh, sort of positing this notion that the three central sort of um, core components of, of leadership is this idea of influence, um, infrastructure, and impact. And what we've seen happen in the movement space is that there are people doing work all across the country, and that's really powerful. That's why I open with, like, I am not the movement. The movement is bigger than me. It's bigger than you. Because we've seen people press for change um, in ways that are really powerful, given their either locale or at the national level, which matters. We believe, one of our critiques of the civil rights movement, and there was some push about this in the class, is that um, one of the things we learned is that we don't want to have one central figure or two central figures in the movement space because you kill those people and you kill the movement. So it's how do we create space for people to lead wherever they are and, and, and let people know that that is a core belief of ours, that is a core value. Um, so when I think about what it means for me to have a big platform, part of it is telling the truth and pushing these messages. Another part of it is amplifying the work that other people are doing to try and create space with the space that I have. I would say, you know, black people, we always face these issues of erasure and erasure manifests in two ways. One is that either the story is never told or is told by everybody but us. And in this moment, we became the unerased. Like literally, we got to tell the story not only in ways that push back against dominant culture, but we got to tell the story to each other differently. Like we got to be in community and blackness in ways that we had not yet had before, and that was powerful. So I think about what it meant to be out there is that we could, you know, I think about Baltimore when the police shot a smoke bomb, it set a trash can on fire, and the police tweeted, like the protesters just set the trash can on fire. A reporter immediately tweeted back and said, you set the trash can on fire. And like in real time, we were able to push back against these narratives that were demonizing black people. And also when we think about building community, it is how I can say I know I know protesters all around the country. We know each other through Twitter. That we it's been this interesting platform for authenticity. I think about August as a time we didn't know each other's hearts, we knew each other's or we didn't know each other's names, we knew each other's hearts. Um, and it was powerful because I think about even people like Netta, I knew her digitally before I knew her in person, and that matters, right? We were able to build these relationships in ways that were really powerful. I think that there is something to telling a consistent narrative. You know, we've been telling this story for a while. Um, and I think that reson I believe that that resonates with people. But I think, I think that the power of social media is that we have, um, we've democratized the site of news. That like people often, one of their criticisms of me and that is like the media made them X, Y, and Z. 
And what I tell people is that the absence of media made me anything, right? Mm -hmm. That like it was, it, was, it was the story not being told that allowed people to listen to us as we told the story. And that is actually, I think, the power of the platform. So, so St. Louis would have, Missouri would have convinced you that we didn't exist. And all of a sudden, excuse me, you go on social media and like, hundreds of people are telling the story that they're saying is not true, which I think changed, I, you know, I was there, so I don't, I, I believe that that is why, you know, people who weren't there, it resonated with them. Um, or you got to see it on the live streams, you know, people, we meet people now who are like, I remember staying up all night watching the live stream, which is like wild to us because we were there, but like that was a thing, you know, people got to be with us who weren't physically with us. And I believe that that mattered. You know, something I talked about when I talked about the political theory of protest in the class, but one of the things that social media did that, is, that, I, that I argue is in the tradition of resistance, definitely in blackness, but in America, is that it rendered the invisible visible. That like with the, that with the terror of policing, like we got to show people, we got to bring it to people's homes in ways that you know people couldn't deny. You saw me get tear gas, like you saw her get shot by a rubber bullet, you saw Wesley get arrested, like you saw it. Um, and that was in the rendering the invisible visible. The power um, of the platform allowed us to do that collectively. <laughs> there, are, there still though remains these problems with the representations of black bodies in the media, right? And like how we talk about whiteness. Um, I often sort of jokingly say on Twitter, watch whiteness work. Like you can, we can see the way that like narratives form when white bodies are privileged um, in mainstream media, whether they are shooters or whether they are, you know, when white people commit crimes, and there's always a story about how great they were, and it was mental health, and it was a you know it was a troubled home. You think about Dylan Roof is like all you know. I I have seen pictures of Dylan Roof open Christmas presents, mm -hmm. which is wild. You know that is like, a, and I'm not seeing any of that with any of the victims. And I like spent time in Charleston afterwards. I'm close to the protesters, but I've seen him open Christmas presents. Right, like the way that the way that we use whiteness to humanize whiteness. Um, still remains like a, a problem, but what is important now is that we are interrogating that in public spaces. I want to ask about church leadership, religious leadership in the midst of the movement. Um, obviously, we're a divinity school, people preparing, many people preparing to, to be at work in the, in the life of religious congregations. Um, does the church still have a moral voice as you in your, in your experience and in your understanding, is there a place for the church in the leadership of, of this movement and the, and the necessity of changing the questions in society? I think I would offer that the, the church can have a moral voice, right? There's space for the church to be. I think that one of the interesting things is when we think about the origin story of the movement, and then when we think about so many other, when we think about the civil rights movement, it was born in these institutions, the institutions of schools and churches. And that is just not what happened here, right? It was like people came outside. So the dependence on those institutions is just different now. I think that we would ask for the church to step up and be, you know, I remember the protests around the black church in St. Louis and there was this thing about like Jesus would be out here with us too, right? That like Jesus was a protester. Um, and, and I do think there has been this calling into question of like how will people live their supposed commitment to Christ? Like what does that look like? Will you stand with the protesters or will you just talk about the protesters? Um, so I'm hopeful that the church, that, this, that the theology of protest will catch up, right, in the mainstream space. I think that we have largely been disappointed um, with like who will stand with people as opposed to who will sort of offer tacit support. I think the church was more cautious than people's understanding of Christ would have been, right? That like Christ would not have taken so long to like, you know, <laughs> to, um, you know. Yeah, that Christ would not have taken so long to sort of contemplate, should I be out there, should I, right? Like, that Christ would have been there, right? And yeah. that like people who, 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 who talk about carrying the message actually aren't living the message. And what we would say is that that is not the Christ that I know, right? Why is the statement Black Lives Matter a controversial statement, right? What, does that, what about that is actually controversial? Um, and what about the controversy, exp you know, I often think that we, um, that we, that we, that we, that we use that phrase not to affirm the worth of our lives, but to expose the hatred we face, right? That like we know we matter, but it is in, in saying the statement that we expose like the underbelly, right? Like the mechanisms that allow Jim Crow to be Jim Crow. I, 
I sometimes jokingly say, but I believe this. So because some people don't like it, I, I offer it as a joke sometimes. But I think that Twitter and the classroom are the last two radical spaces in America, right? Mm -hmm. I think of Twitter as a place where like, we have um, democratized the way that people interact with each other, especially in blackness. And we've certainly democratized news that, like, that the platform just allows for an opening of the public sphere that we could not have imagined. And I think that that in and of itself is radical. I think that it is a word that is beyond radical that I don't have access to right now um, for black people, that like we have literally not had this space before. I think about the classroom as the last space that actually believes in the sanctity of ideas. And I think that like, that there is something that is so beautiful about that, that like makes all classrooms matter. It is how we tell the stories of resistance. Um, it is how we uh, learn how to be in community with each other. That happens in classrooms. Um, and that will always be important to me as somebody who used to, you know, I used to teach sixth grade math and I think about uh, the way that the way that I interacted with my students is also telling them about what power looked like, right? So when I could tell them like you could get up and go to the bathroom when you wanted to, that I was trying to teach them something about their relationship to authority, right? And like how they could manage themselves. And I think that classrooms become, in, in the way that we have configured this society, classrooms become a space where we can teach about resistance in really subtle ways. I think classrooms also become a space where we need to tell the stories better. You know, I talked about this in class, but I think about the way that we've mistold or uh, misread so many stories in history about the civil rights movement. I thought you were saying something. I was like, what? <laughs> um, <laughs> the way that we've mistold so many stories, I think about um, Montgomery as I didn't know until I went to Selma in Montgomery that it was a professor and two students who printed out 50,000 flyers, went around Montgomery and passed them out and started the boycotts. That is not how we have told the story of resistance. We've told it in a way that does not privilege the fact that you are enough to start a movement. Um, and we need to tell the truth, right? Like we have to tell that. I worry about how we've told the story of this movement, right? That what is so powerful to me is that it was people who came out of their homes and started this space. There was no one, two, three, four, or five people that did it. There was no call to action by an organization. It was people who came outside and did it. And that to me will always be the most powerful part of this because what it shows you again is that you are enough to start the movement. Um, and that's how I think about classrooms. But it goes back to this core idea about like the last places where the idea is important. This, this notion that like our ideas can be in conflict without us being in conflict is something that I think is most true in classrooms. Mm -hmm. right? So how do we like, continue to like push back on these narratives, um, these narratives in ways that empower people and give people language to do the same thing wherever they are? Mm -hmm. Like I think there's a lot of space there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think we want to thank you for, for a rich conversation, for being with us in the whole year. <laughs>